Thanks, Nick. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, my spiritual siblings. How are you all? I want to shout out to Lucille and Gary for hosting me. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. None of us are free if one of us are chained. Solomon Burke. Well, you better listen, my brothers and sisters. Because if you do, you can hear there are voices still calling across the years. And they're crying across the ocean. And they're crying across the land. And they will till we will all come to understand. None of us are free if one of us are chained. And there are people still in darkness and they can, just can't see the light. And if you don't say it's wrong, then you say that it's right. We got to try to feel each other. Let our brothers know that we care. Got to get the message. Send it out loud and clear. None of us are free if one of us are chained. None of us are free if one of us are chained. It's a simple truth we all need just to hear and to see. None of us are free if one of us are chained. None of us are free. Now, I swear your salvation isn't too hard to find. None of us can find it on our own. We've got to join together in spirit, heart, and mind so that every soul who's suffering will know they're not alone. None of us are free. None of us are free if one of us are chained None of us are free. If you just look around you, you're going to see what I say because the world is getting smaller each passing day. And now it's time to start making changes and it's time for us all to realize that the truth is shining real bright right before our eyes. None of us are free if one of us are chained. None of us are free if one of us are chained. None of us are free. In these times, the idea of freedom looms large for me. I'm on fire. I was born on February 12th. That's the same birthday as Abraham Lincoln. So I feel a deep kinship with his ideals, his perspectives, and his passions. In 1855, he wrote to his lawyer, George Robertson, and he said, on the question of liberty as a principle, we are not what we have been. When we were the political slaves of King George and wanted to be free, we called the maxim that all men are created equal a self-evident truth. But now, we have grown fat, and we have lost all dread of being slaves ourselves. We have become so greedy to be masters that we call the same maxim a self-evident lie. Is that a lie that I can live with deep in my soul and my psyche? Now, this was a letter about slaves, African Americans who were for far too long were not even considered fully human or counted as relevant. Of course, in the 1780s, for a tax inducement, the South agreed to how slaves would be counted when determining a state's total population for legislative purposes and for tax purposes. It was called a three fifths compromise solution. And that was to count three out of every five slaves as a person. And let's not forget the one drop rule, a social and legal principle of racial classification. In the United States, this was a historically prominent assertion that held that any person with even one ancestor of sub-Saharan African ancestry, one drop of black blood, is considered black. So in the 1700s, freedom was doled out by degree of color. Today, you're either free or you're not. Have we become a national community that's grown fat? Have we lost all dread of being slaves ourselves? Have we become so greedy to be masters that we call the same maxim, all men are created equal, a self-evident lie? 
In my childhood, my mother referred to the state of our household self-centeredness as the IGM mentality. I got mine mentality. <laughs> now she held this micro statement when someone finished the last square of toilet tissue and did not replace it, or drank the last drop of milk and neither replaced it nor made it clear that there was no more milk, so the next person would suffer the consequences. The IGM mentality falls to those who feel quite self-satisfied and therefore not looking out for the next person. And in some dreadful ways, the IGM mentality can describe new American values. The deterioration is evident in disturbing ways. Heavy reversals of long-held beliefs and freedoms, privacy, they're overshadowed by design and careless decrees. Long-lasting traditions cast aside for other short-term immediate gratifications. Well, you better listen, my sisters and brothers, because if you do, you can hear there are voices still calling across the years, and they're crying across the ocean, and they're crying across the land, and they will till we come to understand that none of us are free if one of us are chained. We are community. Spirit lives in community. Freedom of community is our charge in our custody. Through political life, we may be told to see div dividing differences among us, and those differences we can blame for fill in the blank. But it's through our spiritual lives that we look for similarities among us that bind us together. Now, you may ask, what does this all have to do with me here at New Thought? Everything. If I enrich myself spiritually, do I not owe a debt of gratitude to give back in some way what I have received? To pass along my learnings and actions to the less able? Do we not owe it to ourselves and to others, to humanity, to define and redefine what spiritual meaning is in our lives? To define and redefine what is authentic, what makes us spiritually, emotionally, and physically free, through which we have learned through hard-won lessons, individually and collectively. President Reagan wrote, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in our bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States when men were free. <coughs> A sobering thought and all too real. I'm reminded of a, a chilling poem. First they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. This was written by Martin Niemerle. He was a Protestant pastor, and he was an early Nazi supporter. He later emerged as an outspoken foe of Hitler, and he spent the last seven years of Nazi rule in concentration camps. Moral freedom, spiritual freedom, is not an issue of left or right, conservative or progressive. I define moral, moral freedom as what is proper to the human race, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what race or gender or creed or orientation, because I abide to the maxim that all men are created equal. We are driven to redefine ourselves through discomfort. Mark Nepo, he's a spiritual writer, a philosopher, and a poet. He edited a book called Deepening the American Dream, Reflections on the Inner Life and Spirit of Democracy. Here's an excerpt. To keep the experiment alive in our own time, we're being asked to deepen where we look for meaning, to expand the circle in which we share that meaning, and to realize that we are more together then we are alone. We believe that the critical issues facing the world today 
require that we go below political, social, and economic strategies to the psychological and spiritual roots of those issues. In entering these realms, we are being forced to search for meaning and community beyond our borders. We are being asked to consider what the Buddhist monk and writer Thich Nhat Hanh has termed our interbeing. Sacred activism is what Andrew Harvey calls a combination of spirituality with activism. I hold that the next wave of spiritual movements will be the connection of all human, animal, and earth rights. All those movements together combined. You know, I love my country. I love my country. I may not love how its values are being dismantled or how representatives behave, but I love America. I vote for freedom, freedom for all living things. I vote to root and care for each other. I vote to be engaged in community, in community building. My immigrant grandparents taught me values that I still espouse, although I no longer think inclusion is the answer. Because when there is inclusion, there is the implication of exclusion. So I embrace pluralism. And to be clear, there, here are four edited points of pluralism as defined by Diana Eck, who I love. She's a foremost professor and lecturer of comparative religion at Harvard University. She wrote this in 2006. First, pluralism is not diversity alone but the energetic engagement with diversity. Mere diversity without real encounter and relationship will yield increasing tensions in our societies. Second, pluralism is not just tolerance, but the active seeking of understanding across lines of difference. Tolerance is a necessary public virtue, but it does not require Christians and Muslims, Hindus, Jews, and ardent secularists to know anything about one another. Tolerance is too thin a foundation for a world of religious difference and proximity. It does nothing to remove our ignorance of one another and leaves in place the stereotype, the half-truth, the fears that underlie old patterns of division and violence. In the world in which we live today, our ignorance, ignorance of one another will be increasingly costly. Third, pluralism is not relativism, but the encounter of commitments. The new paradigm of pluralism does not require us to leave our identities or our commitments behind. Pluralism is the encounter of commitments. It means holding our deepest differences, even our religious differences, not in isolation, but in relationship to one another. And fourth, pluralism is based on dialogue. The language of pluralism is that of dialogue and encounter, give and take criticism and self-criticism. Dialogue means both speaking and listening, and that process reveals both common understanding, understandings and real differences. Dialogue does not mean anyone at the table will agree with one another. Pluralism involves the commitment to being at the table with one's commitment. My commitment to pluralism is to seek to be available and to engage dialogue with the other in order to live in harmony, to relieve myself of the I got mine mentality, to care for the freedom of each individual and live in community. And that means to be open to understand the Muslims who live down the block from me, the Chinese and the Polish immigrants who live to the left and right of me, to engage with the Bulgarian man who serves me coffee and with all of their cultural differences. That means for me to honor the air, the wingeds in the air, the oceans, the fishes in the ocean, the earth, the trees, and the four-leggeds who walk this earth with us. My commitment is to be aware of my biases, which I have, and root them out so that I can be more effective as a citizen in this world. For example, when I was in the waiting room for physical therapy, I had a conversation with a Muslim woman. She talked about my hair, and I talked about her hijab. 
It was very enlightening. I learned something, <laughs> and so did she. <laughs> my commitment means to take action. Writing letters to my congressmen and women to let them know that I support freedom and spiritually moral truth of the families and children at the borders. It means that I believe splitting families and shipping children off to live in massive facilities where three-year-olds are, are made to wash toilets, where these children sleep behind cyclone fences on floor mats, not knowing where their families are or if they will ever see them again or what their future is. That what my congresswoman said about this situation after her Texas visit seeing the children's conditions, that these children are not being talked to, no one is touching them or hugging them, and that this does not portray the values as we share as Americans. And we know that infants die without physical contact. That this is spiritually, morally, emotionally, and democratically wrong. Is this the America I was born into? Are these the human behaviors that represent who I am and my values? We have got to feel for each other. Let our brothers know we care. Got to get the message. Send it out loud and clear. Lincoln said, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. It's time for us to realize the truth is shining real bright, right before our eyes. Both Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama have said the Buddha will come as community, not as an individual. So now with the press of one interrelated world and the limits of any other way of seeing, we are being asked to imagine how can we go there together well, we got to join together in spirit, heart, and mind. If nothing is done, if we do not protect innocent children in our own country, then who are we? None of us are free if one of us is chained. Because if we are spiritually free, or we are on the spiritual path, or we have had a spiritual awakening, have the presence of mind, then we are equipped to do something of import beyond ourselves, beyond the I got mine mentality. The ego says, my little bit doesn't count. Wrong. Every little bit counts. And the collective we trumps the individual me. Making a pledge of interdependence, of interbeing, taking action for what I am democratically, spiritually, and believe proper to the entire human race. Of the so many wrongs, pick one. Immigrants' rights, human trafficking, animal and environment welfare, pick one and commit to do something. Stand on your spiritual legs and walk toward freedom. And to those of us who are doing something, thank you. Thank you for living up to your potential as fully humane, empathic beings in the human race. Thank you for listening to the voices calling across the ocean, calling across the years, calling across the land. Thank you for honoring that all men are created equal is a self-evident truth and that you are willing to stand up for freedom to redefine yourself through discomfort. And whether your contribution is large or small, that it matters. Being of service matters. Thank you for knowing the light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God protects us. Wherever we are, God is. Thank you for knowing and living out. None of us are free if one of us are chained. And so it is. <laughs> <laughs>